Hey there, unconventional conventionists. Thanks for tuning in to Time Warp Radio, the Rocky Horror Picture Show movie by minute podcast, where with each seven minutes, bum, 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 we, we can, can make, make you, you a fair. <laughs> I'm Haley Ravini. And I'm Katie Tomini. And we are your resident criminologists on all things Rocky Horror. Today's episode's timestamps are our 1 minute 9 second 48 to our 1 minute 16 second 32. And are they sending them to another planet? Or is it just Schmanit Janet? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be dissecting Dr. Scott's monologue, Columbia's monologue, Frank's monologue, and Crim's monologue, because we are getting all the narrative we could have ever asked for, and more, and in the most breakneck speed possible. <laughs> Honestly, I think the only thing we're missing is that long um, magenta monologue like that comes at the very end. <sighs> I know that monologue is going to be... Um, uh, I'm just, I think Magenta's the secret of it all. I think she's ultimately why Riff Raff is doing what he's doing. I think Richard may have been, like, in love with Pat, honestly. He was in love with Pat. He was in love with Nell. He was in love with Tim. Yeah. He was in love with Peter. Oh, yeah. You Like, come on, so am I. I can't, <laughs> like, whatever. Seriously. Uh, but we're also going to be profiling Charles Gray, who's more than okay. He's great. And also another, uh, oh boy, like he and Dr. Scott are tied for most confusing character in Rocky Horror. Totally. Is he human? Is he alien? Are you ready to dive in? Yes. So Frank has just pulled away the tablecloth to reveal that glass coffin containing the semi-composed, semi-decomposed, shaved off (laughs) remains of Eddie, which is playing with the trope to serve man, which is named for the Twilight Zone episode where you cannot judge a book by its cover. Um, Aliens are not of service to mankind. They're... Uh, they like humans better with ketchup. <laughs> it's so interesting that over and over in sci-fi media that, yeah, humans are like the delicacy of Earth. When there's other species, there's other animals or plant matter that the aliens could consume. Yeah, I mean, like, there's even, like, the most dangerous game, like, Literally, the ultimate prey is man. How? Uh. 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 Gives me the creeps. Oh, you mean you don't want to come to my uh, island um, for a special dinner? (laughs) (laughs) And I think it's so interesting, too, because it's also like a horror trope that zombies and vampires will eat humans for sustenance so it's not just aliens that are sometimes dining on man but also how metal they're eating eddie over his dead body (laughs) literally it's also another trope of dead man's chest where like you've got a dead body don't know where to hide it because his uncle is now snooping around the place. Shove it in the unused dining table. We can use that for storage. Okay, but like that dining table, it's literally just a coffin with like a glass top. Like my dining table doesn't look like that. So you think he set the table on top of the coffin? 
I yeah, I think so. Like intentionally, it was a it was a coffin. It's not like the dining table that he normally eats on. No, I think it's like a like for sure the coffin, and they put a slab of glass on top of it. Open casket. <laughs> it's like a magic trick, but none of the condiments stay on the table. They all fly off with the <laughs> tablecloth. And they spill everywhere. He is not planning on cleaning any of that up. Oh, no. And this is just so, like, you, what? Huh? (laughs) Like, I think it's interesting because it's juxtaposing the horror of murdering this person with the mundane acts of, like, making dinner. Yeah. And, like... The mundane acts of domesticity (laughs) that for them, it's no different than just like catching their meal for the night. Well, and I think that like to go back to Frank not planning on cleaning up, I think it's not only that he doesn't ever clean up after himself anyways. I think it's also that he's kind of given up at this point. Like he knows that it's over. He knows that he's been found out. He knows that there's literally no going back from here. I agree with you for a different reason. I think his experiment is completed. So from the from the bedroom scenes on, it's just like fun and games for Frank Mm. because he's already impregnated Janet. Yeah. So like, who cares who knows that I killed Eddie? Who cares who knows that I'm a cannibal? Riff Raff and Magenta, Magenta. Jane it. Are you decent, Jane it? Magenta. <laughs> Riff Raff and Magenta laugh and laugh and laugh as Janet runs on and off screen screaming. Yes. <laughs> past Dr. Scott, who like wheels back from the table in an alarm. And uh, Janet runs back into the scene into Rocky's arms. And I think Riff and Magenta see the plan is coming perfectly together. Uh, Frank is perfectly falling apart. Mm -hmm. And Janet is back to her Janet drama ways. Mm -hmm. (laughs) She could have gone to Brad, which I think we said last time would have been further from Frank. More like a table's length of protection away from Mm Frank. Her assailant. (laughs) But instead she runs closer to Frank to be in the arms of the muscle man. Um, Well, not only that, but Brad was right next to her. Rocky is like literally catty corner across the table. She has to run all the way around the table to get to him. Which he's fine with because he smiles and he like lovingly embraces her and just kind of like snuggles her in. (laughs) And I'm wondering... If Dr. Scott was actually surprised or if that was like him reacting because he needed Frank to not suspect that he's been cross surveilling. Mm. Mm. Or do you think he's truly like had no idea he did he think that Eddie was alive somewhere in the castle? I think he might have thought that Eddie had gotten away. And that he was truly surprised. And that he just came looking for information? Yeah. Because I didn't, I don't think I asked this last time, but what is the possibility of Dr. Scott forging the note? Hmm. I mean, it's definitely possible because we did have a ton of questions on how this note got to him in Mm -hmm. the first place so like definitely possible but at the same time i want to believe him a little bit you know what i mean like yeah but i think he's the villain now (laughs) i think dr scott's the villain like frankenfurter's the villain on the surface and also not on the surface, because he does some pretty lurid acts. Yeah. But then also, Dr. Scott... Is a Nazi doctor? Well, I'm just... 
literally a Nazi doctor. Yeah, and he also... Uh, I haven't thought enough about superheroes yet. I think he could have forged the note if he knew that Eddie was there and was trying to finagle away inside. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know. I don't know how present Dr. Scott really was in Eddie's life. Do you think he knew that Eddie was dead at that point? Kind of. Like, I do think he was singing Eddie's Teddy as, like, an obituary. Mm. And that he probably came a little bit too late because the note is warning that he might be dead. So... I don't know if Dr. Scott, too, is like, this note could have come from any time ago. It could not be a recent note. So, like, as a final plea, if he happens to be alive somewhere somewhere in here, uh, you can release him back to me. And yeah. And Frank is like, mwahaha, no. What if Dr. Scott was also carrying out evil medical experiments on Eddie? So Eddie just left one abusive household to go to another. Well. I mean, I don't... It's possible. It's possible. I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) Eddie didn't have any positive role models in his life. Poor thing. We just... Poor guy. He needed therapy. But so Janet's run into Rocky's arms and Frank... When he pulled that tablecloth back, it's like he sat into one of the Lazy Boy recliners because then he has to get up from the chair he's sitting in. (laughs) He is heartbroken. He leaps up, says, Oh, Rocky! Forcibly removes his party hat. How could you? And hurls Rocky away from Janet. At a whips him away, then turns back and slaps Janet just right upside the face. And he's like foaming at the mouth. He's so upset. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's too much to deal with because Dr. Scott's already too much to deal with. (laughs) And now he has to remember that he just interrupted Janet and Rocky post coital in the tank. Not that long ago. This spurs... And everything goes from 0 to 80 miles per hour. I mean, it goes from like 30 to like 90. Okay. Because like we're we're moving, but like it all of a sudden just like takes off. Yeah, we were on a car that was having brake issues like <laughs> slowing down throughout and then now the brakes have cut loose and oh, we're yeah. just like careening off a mad cliff in this narrative janet runs out of the dining hall um when frank slaps her across the face that spurs brad into super asshole part d and he removes his eyeglasses <laughs> I don't know why that's his, like, I'm being serious. <gasps> Take me seriously. Damn it. But he not only, like, rips off his glasses, he, like, runs to Dr. Scott. Mm-hmm. Not to Janet's aid, but straight to Dr. Scott. Like, I've seen it so many times that I'm like, of course he goes to Dr. Scott, because who else is going to make sure that everyone gets up to the lab to see what happens. But like, also... It's not like Riff and Magenta are going to take Dr. Scott. Help your fiancé. I know! <laughs> he doesn't... I Then, I, yes, I started thinking he could have easily taken off running, too. He's not in heels at this point. Yeah, Frank is in, like, six-inch platform heels. He could have taken him out. And I would even argue that Brad could have overtaken frank because frank stops janet at the landing Mm -hmm. so that's precious time that brad could have come up behind him and tossed frank over the banister down the stairs 
gotten his fiance out of there. But no, you're right. He goes straight to Dr. Scott and starts pushing him out of the dining room. Mm -hmm. Dr. Scott's the one who like points and like Mm -hmm. is directing Brad where to go. To go this way, this way, out this way. And, like, it says in the script that he points in Janet's direction to follow. Mm -hmm. But we don't know for sure that he's directing Brad towards Janet. He might just be directing him, like, either out of the castle or to the lab or to go find more evidence of Eddie. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't Mm -hmm. know where Dr. Scott's pointing him to because Brad doesn't even have his glasses on. He He doesn't even know where he's going. He's a terrible navigator at this point. That's to he's how is he <sighs> I don't get it. I don't get it. And then I started to think that it's like an employee obligation of like if Brad is there to observe Frankenfurter and now his boss is there to join in the observation. <laughs> He needs to make sure that Dr. Scott stays with the group. Ugh. And, like, is that all in the plan? Okay, but, like, Dr. Scott got up those stairs the first time, fine. I think he didn't know how he was going to get in. <laughs> like, I don't think... And then, honestly, like, you just remove dinner scene, and they end up right back in the laboratory, right back in the same positions they were in, mm-hmm. right back... Uh, on track with the filming schedule because they filmed all of like the laboratory dialogue and scenes. Yeah, kind of all at the same time. Yeah. So it's like they could have skipped dinner scene, which makes me wonder why they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> You have to hear that they're aliens. True. And you have to find out that they are cannibalistic aliens. True. So, like, not... More is at stake. Right. Like... Stake. Ha! Ah. So, Uh-oh. as Janet is running, she is not running to the exit of the house. She is, like, running up and down the stairs? So, she runs straight toward the door and then takes a hard left turn up the stairs. <laughs> She doesn't even, I don't think it even occurs to her to run anywhere else in the house because Frank is like right on her tail too. I will give her that, that he's like directing her toward the lab. I think Frank's trying to get them all back to where he can Medusa them. Fair. And that like, I bet he can Medusa them from anywhere in the house. Probably. But he wants to have them all in one place. Like, he needs to keep... Well, no. He doesn't... I don't think he even cares about Brad and Dr. Scott at no. this point. No. Either, to be honest. I don't either. And, and like, I'm confused because Janet is still wearing her shoes at this point. Like, she very easily could have just run outside and gone to anywhere else. Literally yes. anywhere else. Yes, because she ends up... They, all three of them, end up outside on the floor in their underwear (laughs) anyway. So, like, she doesn't have any thing to lose if she were to run out of the house right now. Other than abandon the people who maybe set her up for this. Bye. (laughs) I'd leave. I'd be like, my fiance is a jerk. Mm-hmm. Our professor's a Nazi jerk. <laughs> I gotta go. See ya. None of you people are are listening to me. I need to get out of here. I, just, I figured I'm this whole thing now. out from the beginning and nobody's been listening to me. Now I'm being chased by an alien. I gotta go. Well, okay, because then I'm also thinking, Dr. Scott, right? I think he... Do you think he knows the Transylvanians' plan to impregnate a female of the species? I think that if him and Frank have had a relationship, no matter what type of relationship, but it seems like they have, um, that he does know 
what the basic outline of Frank's plan is. Because then I think he wants to observe Janet too. Like Dr. Scott want Because, okay, Rocky Horror Roll Call, right? Mm-hmm. He sees Brad, and it's like, oh, oh, Brad. <laughs> wink, wink, didn't expect to see you there. But then when he realizes, oh, shit, no, when I told Brad this was a job, I meant for just Brad to do this job. Not oh, to shit. bring the woman along. Yes, I didn't include Janet. I haven't hired Janet for this job. When, okay, Janet... Is just as, um, capable. Into- yeah, intellectually <laughs> capable of completing this mission as Brad is. In fact, probably more capable than Brad is. Yeah, because she doesn't need to have the, uh, she doesn't need to have things mansplained to her. Because <laughs> um, she's just observant. She's see- recognizing what the bells and whistles that are going off. Yeah. And, um... But she, everything that she misses, it's because she's been set up to fail. Like, Mm -hmm. if Brad knew they were aliens from the jump and has been wanting to observe all of the Transylvanians in Time Warp and then continue observing the mad scientist's experiment, Dr. Scott is obviously pretty invested in whatever is happening. Mm -hmm. He directs Brad... This way, this way. We see a little crocodile, a little taxidermy crocodile with neck frills on a podium in the hallway. We cut back to Magenta and Riff Raff continuing to laugh hysterically. And Pat, oh my gosh. So there's a video that I put on the blog spot for the last episode. But Pat talks about how she was so uncomfortable from that reveal and really didn't know how to react in that moment. It was like truly laughing out of shock and (laughs) was waiting just for someone to yell cut or like, how does this end? And she just keeps going until literally the writer tells her to shut up, you know? Then we cut to the hall and stairs of the castle where Janet is running, hoofing it up those stairs, followed by Frank closely in pursuit. He traps her at the landing of the second flight of stairs and gets both arms around her and, like, latches onto the banister. So he really gets her in, like, a lock Mm -hmm. in in that position. This is the most ineffective, cardio-intense escape route Yeah, like Janet could have come up with. Janet, why are you taking the stairs up? <laughs> it's like every freaking horror movie that you've ever watched. <laughs> yes. They all go upstairs. Why are you going upstairs to escape? It's There's a trap. There's no freaking way to get out of the house from upstairs unless you jump out of a window. Why right. are you doing that? Yes. And especially when she knows where the entrance is. It's she not was, like oh, she you was, mean the entrance that she was right next to that yeah. she didn't go out of. Yeah, it's not like she was uh, kidnapped into this place and then woke up out of it and was like, I don't know where the front door might be. But when we're shadow casting this, when I say cardio intense, do I mean <laughs> <laughs> this is the wake up call? Right before floor show that, like, gets you awake. uh, Like, you're (laughs) running through the aisles. You're running up and down the, uh, just everywhere you can go. I'll pick a a row of seats to shimmy uncomfortably down and, like, get in people's (laughs) faces pre-COVID, you know? And... It's so much fun because those are the there aren't a whole lot of opportunities for the shadow cast to like go into the audience. Yes, that's the audience participation that yeah. I think people come for. That um, well, and, and Janet is yes running, but as a Brad, I will go ahead and say at least you don't have to push an adult human being in a wheelchair while doing this. Because then you're 
will you take just across, Dr. Scott back and forth across the stage? Um, usually what I do is I will push him about halfway up an aisle then I'll push him back down and then I'll go across to the other aisle, go about like maybe a quarter of the way up and then back down. Um, Add to the insanity. Yeah, just to like yes. create more chaos happening. And like it just helps to make you less bored while you're waiting for Frank and Janet to get back up to the front, honestly. <laughs> because they take forever. <laughs> We'll get to the their their <laughs> ineffective route. But yeah, we'll just run through the aisles. We'll stop at one point. Um, I'll maybe sit in someone's lap as Janet so that Frank can like trap me with somebody. That's fun. Um, and then I'll run back up the aisles, back on the steps, and then we get Medusa. It's pretty straightforward, this this shadow casting um but janet does not know the layout of the castle she knows it roughly she's like seen her way to her room but it's not exactly a fair fight yeah and she's also half struggling when frank (laughs) traps her she's like she hates it but like she's maybe a little into it a little bit bondage and submission you know And she doesn't try slapping him. Like, her hands are free. So she could try, like, hitting him or pushing him away from her. But she's very polite in this (laughs) fight. Um, And so begins Wise Up Janet Weiss, part one of Planet Schmanet, Janet Weiss. It is a... I think people forget this song exists, too. They forget that it's, like, a musical number. Honestly, this one's a really quick one, and I think you forget about it because the music behind it is so fun. The bum ba na bum ba na bum ba na bum And you're mostly focused on that and, like, them running, and you don't realize that Frank is singing along to it. Well, I know it's Rose's favorite song, actually. I think that it, that Planet Schmidt is her favorite song. Really? I think so. I think she's... Anyway, Frank is holding Janet down. He tells her, I'll tell you once, won't tell you twice. You better wise up, Janet Weiss. My S's are usually bad on this podcast. It's just going to be worse. (laughs) This whole song is going to be so bad. (laughs) Um... What do you, why is Frank telling Janet to wise up? What is he? I think that he knows that she has caught on. I think that he knows that she is probably the most in on his plan. So I think it's kind of not sarcastic, but kind of like a, like a nudge, like, I know you know more than you're letting on. Yeah, maybe he's letting her, like, think harder. I'm not going to lay it out for you because you're a smart girl. Mm -hmm. Figure it out. Figure it out, Miss Weiss. Um, And it's also a great name association, pun, name title, song lyric. Also, the hissing is, like, probably one of my favorite callbacks, even though it's not a real, like call back no i add hisses to to every word yes yeah, <laughs> every line even the ones that don't end in s's or like in s, i will hiss at the end of like every line no the when we went to the drive-in the other night at the frida when we did rocky horror at the frida which is why this episode God. is late because we were at the drive-in at the Frida. I was, I could not tell you how happy I am for it to be back. And it didn't even take a whole year. We're not doing full shadow casting. But, like, to see the movie again with uh, folks who I knew were regulars because I could hear them yelling callbacks from their cars. Mm-hmm. And I recognized their voices. So... 
it was just like so 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 it was so, so, wonderful. so wonderful but when we got to this part of the movie i without my own um i can't control myself i just start <laughs> hissing it's like every single i was sitting in the back seat of of Katie's car and I just started hissing after being quiet for I don't know how long and I was just like I can't resist the hiss so good um Frank lays on the sick burns with your apple pie don't taste too nice rude 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 Janet thinks it's rude too she goes ugh because who says that to a person well especially because he just very likely stole her virginity away uh-huh. from her. He was her first experience sexually. Uh-huh. And then he's going to tell her, hmm, wasn't great. Yeah, to make any kind of comment on that encounter. That, like, automatically makes him an unsafe, like, partner Ugh. for that kind of uh, interaction. Because, yeah, you want someone you feel safe with and comfortable with. So, okay, Janet now is like, this is not the person I was so charmed by Mm -hmm. earlier tonight. I'm not going to be so easily wooed by you anymore. Ugh. And what's even worse is he, like, smiles at her like it's a joke. I don't think it's funny. No. He says, even though he he warned that he wouldn't tell her more than once, he tells her, you better wise up Janet Weiss. And he's going to say it like a bunch of more times, too. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Janet, to break away, knees him right in the junk. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He, right in the head. He, like... Folds in half in pain (laughs) and she runs up the stairs because she's pissed now. Like at first she was like, oh, I'm kind of into this. Like you're chasing me, whatever. And then once he said that, nope, needs him in the nuts. Uh She's out of there. Mm -hmm. And he looks like he had no idea that's what that felt like. He had no idea that's what getting kicked in the anatomy of a man. (laughs) How that makes your stomach feel. I can't guess. Nope. Nope. Sorry. Can't. Haven't experienced that. <laughs> we'll never experience that. But okay, she runs still up the stairs instead of at this point back down the stairs and out of the house. You know? Mm-hmm. She stills like going further into the maze. Confused. Disoriented. We cut to the lift in the hall. Where Brad and Dr. Scott are already in the elevator. Brad is closing the gate behind them. He peers in because he can't he can't really see that well. He doesn't have his glasses. So someone forgot their glasses. <laughs> Brad presses the button on the elevator and then starts to like peer around to see if anybody's on his tail. Brad and Dr. Scott taking the elevator right now is my biggest argument why Dr. Scott breaking through the wall is required. Do you know what I mean? Because Brad wasn't going to push Dr. Scott up the ch- up the stairs. <laughs> so yeah. he knew, and it's not like Dr. Scott knew to take the elevator when he uh, started poking around. Yeah. So Brad knows that's the secret entrance to the secret lab control panel of the ship, Mm -hmm. right? If Brad and Dr. Scott are taking the elevator, how is Janet going to get to the lab? Okay, but also why are they going to the lab? Why aren't they trying to find Janet? Are they stopping on every floor and getting out and looking? Like, why are they going to the lab? I don't think... I don't think Janet knows where she's even running to. I think she just thinks she's going to keep running. Okay, but then that furthers my question. Why are they going to the lab? I think Brad looks around, sees that he isn't going to push Dr. Scott up the stairs, and just gets in the elevator, knowing that it like he can look out of the elevator and maybe see where they go. 
Unless, what if Brad and Dr. Scott don't even care about Janet at this point? They're not looking for her. They're not trying to help her. They're not trying to save her. They see this as an opportunity to go check out the lab with nobody else there because Frank is busy. Uh, uh, Yeah. Yeah. Incapacitated. (gasps) Uh, skeevy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I love it and I hate it. It makes Brad an asshole. It really does. Mm -hmm. It gives new meaning to the callback. If, yeah, if he was like, the job is important. Work over anything. Mm. And, okay, what if also the elevator is one way directional? Like it either is on the ground floor or you press a button and now it's on the other floor? You mean like you can't stop in the middle? Yes. And that it only... Because when we fly past the, uh, you know, the shaft, Mm -hmm. the exterior of the shaft, we don't see a landing on that floor. Yeah. So like, I think it's just... An elevator shaft that is one way. Like, he gets in it, like... Or do you think the castle has a basement? No. No basement? No. We would have gone there. It's a very Frankenstein thing, so I don't think we would have neglected the basement if there was one. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes. I do. I Like, also, Brad and Dr. Scott taking the elevator is such a long route to take if they're trying to catch Frank and Janet Mm -hmm. and uh, Brad knows how slowly the elevator moves because they took it up to the elevator after Sweet Tea so I I don't know if he's that concerned for Janet's not only then he also took it when he was in the elevator with uh, Frank and Riff and Frank was beating the crap out of Riff That's right. Yes. So So Brad has taken this elevator multiple times, knows how slow it is, and still decides to take it. But that's that's even more support for what you were saying of how Brad is... Not trying to help Janet. Yes. Knows that is the secret entry and is just showing Dr. Scott it. Yep. Uh, We cut to the interior of that second floor. Mm -hmm. I think it's got to be the second floor. It's got to be the second floor. Yeah. And we're following the same camera path and track that Dr. Scott took up to the lab. Janet doesn't know that's the way to the lab. No. Because when she went for Tetra, she also took the elevator. Mm Mm-hmm. So she hasn't really taken this route at all. Yeah. I don't know which door is supposed to be the doors Brad and Janet, like their individual rooms are supposed to be in. But I think Columbia's door is supposed to be the door, which would be the last door on the left as you're turning left and Janet and Frank are running up the stairs Mm -hmm. because that's where we get the inner cut on Scott's path of making the loop into Columbia's room. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but, and and this has to be where Columbia hears them and comes out of her room after crying about Eddie during mm-hmm. dinner scene, you know? Mm-hmm. Because she's gone, but we see her a little bit later. I still don't know where Janet's trying to hide. Me neither. Is she trying to lock herself in the room that she was in? Like, is she going to the pink room? Like, where is she going? Is she trying to find another exit? Like, Go I, back I really, to the tank? I don't know. Yeah. And she's running around the elevator shaft. The elevator is slowly rising past it. The camera pans with them as Janet runs up that last flight of stairs and off screen, followed by Frank. Um, do you think Frank would have, again, triple contact, electromagneted Dr. Scott up into the lab if he and Brad did not follow? I don't think so. I don't think that Frank has any, like, interest in them at that point. Sure. 
yeah. I think because he only Medusa's the people who like happen upon them. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Because I think, well, then I also wonder if Frank wanted to keep Janet for observation. And yeah. it doesn't matter, like, again, Brad and Dr. Scott don't matter because, sure, observe us all you want. Yep. <laughs> right back at you, buddies. Mm-hmm. Um, exactly. I don't think that he cares at all about anybody except for Janet at this point. I think that he was trying to chase her up into the lab. Didn't care if anybody else went. Does Frank remember that there's a whole... Yes, he knows there's a whole bust in the wall. Because I'm wondering, too, if Frank was just trying to get Janet in another dead end. Mm. Just take... And that would make sense if it's a lab with no doors for people who are trying to break into it to think... Oh, I'm just going to keep going up and up and up and up and up the stairs. And then you turn around because there's no door. There's no nothing. But mwahaha, there's Frank with a pickaxe. (laughs) Frank is yelling narrative to Janet as he's chasing her. He says, I've laid the seed. It should be all you need. Does anybody hear this? Is it just that I'm like... Whoa, Frank is outright saying, I've laid the seed. He's outright insinuating that he impregnates Janet. How do we not talk about this all the time? Because it goes by so quick. Like I said, nobody realizes with the fun, like, beat in the background and them running around crazy. I don't think anybody realizes the words of this song. Because you interpret that straight and... He's saying that he's impregnated her and also that getting pregnant and having a baby is the answer for all of females' problems and that becoming a mother should give you fulfillment. Right, Janet? Mm. Or is he saying, like, laid the seed like he's planted an idea in her head Mm. that there's more to life than expectations conventionality, domesticity, doing what's expected out of her, because... I mean, like, I could see that for sure. Like, you see, there's there's more that you can do other than just be a wife. Like, I can see that that's what he means by I've laid the seed of, like, I gave you this other idea. Because she could have a career in science. Mm-hmm. Because she's smart. He showed her that she is smart and that she is capable of doing scientific research. Because she observes just as much as Brad does in, not the, more. in the creation scene. Um, and yeah, if not more, she tames the creature. Mm-hmm. She's able to relate to Rocky and Rocky straight falls up in love with her. Gorillas in the mist did Rocky. <laughs> he continues... You're essential as a pencil, wound up like an Eeyore fur string. Wait, say it slower. You're essential as a pencil, wound up like an Eeyore first string. He somehow figures out how to rhyme (laughs) words that do not rhyme (laughs) again and again. What an insult to hurl! He... The insults, just whammies again and again. Because he's telling her like she's straight and narrow, uptight, tightly wound, another sick burn. (laughs) And it's also showing that Frank is knowledgeable of earth instruments and, Mm -hmm. and guitars. And even in being a complete queen and diva, he still brings a musicality. Yeah, definitely. And I was trying to figure out, I've never known what he says at that part because it goes so quickly and it's just kind of, it sounds like nonsense words. Mm -hmm. Um, So when I found out he says wound up like an E or first string, I was like, what could that even mean? Then I realized the first string on a guitar, the E string, is the one that when you scrape your fingernail on it, it goes because it's wound up with 
other wire to make it thicker, but mm-hmm. still flexible. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In the original script, mm-hmm. they had Janet arriving at a door that does not open, that she tries to open, that only opens when Frankenfurter stands in front of it. And it's like a secret entry that they swoop swoop like go into the lab and the door slams back in dr scott's face as he's like catching up to them and i love that they make her take a different route than brad and Mm -hmm. dr scott because it does bring up the fact that brad doesn't know that janet's going to the lab yeah why does he just hop in the elevator why does he assume that she's going there if he assumes that at all Frank asks Janet, when we made it, did you hear a bell ring? ding a ling a ling a ling Is he asking if she can tell that she's pregnant? I mean, I'm on the same boat as you where I think she's pregnant at the end. Yeah. For sure. Because he could also be saying, we made it like oh, you're no sex. longer a virgin. When I'm so important in your life that you are no longer considered a virgin. <laughs> The, the concept of virginity is stupid. It's fine. But it's also like, I wonder too if it's like the realization and the light bulb going off for Janet of like, oh, sex is fun. Sex mm-hmm. doesn't have to just be with the person that I marry. Yep. Sex doesn't just have to be with men. Did a bell ring? Did something go off for you that like, oh, it's more than that. It's mm-hmm. more than just conventionality. We get that ding a ling a ling a ling ling, which transitions us into the fastest one shot sweeping pan to kind of catch everyone up into the room we're back in now. Yes. Like, okay. Janet runs out of the hole in the wall, mm-hmm. realizes she's in the lab. Okay. Runs back down the ramp as Frank is in pursuit of her. But as we're panning her running down the ramp, the elevator is coming up Mm -hmm. the shaft. So Brad and Dr. Scott are arriving. Frank bypasses Janet on the ramp, cuts her off to beat her back to the control panel. She trips. Poor thing. Well, she kind of trips, but she also falls on nothing. No, she, like, hits the edge. There's, like, a little lip. And she (laughs) hits the lip and then falls forward. Because he just jumps over the lip. Mm Mm-hmm. Because I think Frank realizes, oh, yeah, I have alien magic technology (laughs) at my disposal. I'm going to use that now. I think it's really funny, though, because you see Brad pushing Dr. Scott towards that same lip. Mm -hmm. And then the next time you cut to them... Dr. Scott is now on that, like, raised... It's, like, three or four inches off the ground. Where the tank is, like, raised. Yes. Yes. And And they're all standing on there. And Magenta and Columbia stood for creation scene. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But how did Brad get Dr. Scott up on that lip? Because he kind of... It's so fast, too, that he hits him on the edge of the lip, and then Frank pulls the Medusa... So it's like... It's pretty quick, yeah. But, uh, you know, movie magic. (laughs) I love this shot, though, because it's just, like, so much action. Frank continues yelling at Janet. You got a block? Take my advice. You'd better wise up Janet Weiss. Thrice now, she must Weiss. Weiss. (laughs) So when he's saying... You got a block? Is he saying, like, birth control? Is he asking if she has an IUD? Yeah, like a a block. Because I think he's insinuating the whole time, I didn't pull out, and unless you were on birth control of some kind, I've laid the seed and it's all you need. Or, you got a block, like, is there a mental block? Mm Mm-hmm. Where you're not understanding what I'm trying to tell you. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. like, all of these things ha- totally could be double meanings. Mm-hmm. All of these things that we're taking as she could be pregnant could also mean something completely different. Yes. And it's it's true because 
he's not telling her anything in real terms. Mm -hmm. He's not giving her any real advice. He's giving her a bunch of metaphors and comparisons. He's not being straightforward at all with his advice. I got curious because I didn't know what birth control was like in the 70s and what, like, Janet, how how much she's set up to fail here. Yeah. Um, the pill was not created until 1960. Mm. In 1965, the Supreme Court ruled in Griswold versus Connecticut that married couples have a constitutional right to privacy that includes the right to use birth control. However, unmarried women were still denied access. Oh, great, great, great. Because that makes so much sense. Oh, yeah, totally. Because, you know, you don't want unwed mothers, but also unmarried women can't be safe. Okay. And it's placing the control still in the man's hands Mm -hmm. by being like, no, you have to get married to a man so you can have a joint decision on your reproductive rights. Oh, you mean like how still in today's America, um, women can't make the decision to get their tubes tied unless they're like already have children over the age of like 35. And if you do try and get it done without meeting those conditions, then um, you're going to have to jump through like literal flaming hoops. hoops. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. We love it. And then in 1968, the FDA approved the use of IUDs. Then within just a few years, more than 10% of women using contraception had IUDs. Then um, in 1969, the the pill was still so new that they had no idea how much hormones to put in these things. Mm -hmm. And they found in 1969 that high doses of estrogen put women at risk for blood clots, heart attacks, strokes, and cancer. And you know what the feminists did in 1970? They were like, you need to change that because we need the pill and you need to make it not dangerous for us. So they challenged the safety of the hormone levels and uh, hormones were lowered to just a fraction of what the original doses were. Nuts. Also in 1970, Congress passed Title X of the Public Health Service Act, which provided low-income individuals with comprehensive family planning services, including contraceptives. Bless. And then in 1972, the Supreme Court ruled in Eisenstadt versus Baird, birth control legal for unmarried people. <sighs> so there's a possibility Janet was on birth control. Yes. Possibility. There's a possibility. She doesn't... I don't think she can hear Frank at at all. So I don't think she can turn around to him and say, Oh yeah, I do have a block. Thanks! That's great advice! I am on birth control already. Janet trips and falls at the bottom of the ramp, but stumbles up onto that lip of the platform. Frank is like, I need all of you insects to stop moving around. (laughs) What else did Dr. Scott and Brad think they were going to do? Did they think they were going to protect Janet? I truly think that they went up to the lab to be sneaky. I think that they didn't think Frank and Janet were going to be there. I think they thought they had time to snoop around. Hmm. I like it. The more we talk about it, the more, like it gives Brad's character more depth than just being... The doofus that... Yeah, because then he really is the asshole. Then it is like Midsommar, where Christian is ignoring Danny the whole time, Mm -hmm. and he gets his comeuppance, because you should listen to the person you decided to invite Mm -hmm. tonight. Frank sings to them all, the transducer will seduce ya. (laughs) And I don't know if you could even call these slant rhymes... Because they're not real rhyming words. He just, like, he does his Tim Curry thing. He's like, Transducer now rhymes with you. (laughs) Sensual and pencil. Same. Yeah. Yeah. Those rhyme. Total rhymes. We get a cut to a close-up of the sonic transducer 
which is between the reactor power input and TV monitor. Uh, not the same as the Medusa no. or the co- triple contact lever. Mm-hmm. Those were all gibberish words that I was just saying. <laughs> <laughs> so the sonic transducer is what an ultrasonic transducer, which is a real thing, by the way. What it does right. is it converts any type of energy into ultrasonic vibrations. Mm-hmm. They really? like bounce off the signal, like echolocation. Yeah. In a well, you know, ultrasounds for pregnant women are ultrasonic transducers. And it measures the time between how you send this, when you send the signal and when you receive its echo, so that the whatever you're trying to measure gets projection mapped. And I think it's also how they find like submarines and Ooh. things like that underwater like it can be used for like a, a magnitude of different things mm-hmm. um but you know it, it it also can can stick your feet to the ground apparently or is it like i'm wondering are they feeling some kind of like effect when they're in their greek statue form I don't like know. what's happening in their brains while they're is it like They're totally wax figured, like they're stuck in place and they can't talk, they can't blink, they can't do anything, but they're still like Christian at the end of Midsommar. (laughs) They're still there. Or are they like taking a nap? Oh, I I would, I I vote for taking a nap. They're just taking like the most awesome waking nap they could have ever accidentally had. Frank presses the lever down, grinning maniacally and sticking his tongue out at them. And they're stuck. Janet pulls at her feet in her white heels. She cannot move them. She, we get a tilt from the feet all the way up to her face. She says, my feet, I can't move my feet. Dr. Scott tries to wiggle the wheels of his wheelchair, and he says, My wheels! My god, I can't move my wheels! Then we cut to Brad with a camera tilt from his socked feet up to him standing upright, saying, It's as if we were glued to the spot! Which I had forgotten that he actually doesn't say, my socks, I can't move my socks. <laughs> because that's the callback for this. And I always just scream it at the top of my lungs. So I forgot that there was not that line in the movie. But okay, I'm curious. If Brad and Janet removed their socks and heels. Could they move? Could they have moved? Um, But if they stepped out of it and put their feet back on the floor, would they get restuck? Ooh, mm. that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that because it's like, then too, if only Dr. Scott's wheels cannot move. And if we're to take the Denton Affair statements as lore. I would think that he would have the best chance because if even if you keep getting stuck, he has his wheelchair. Then he stands up out of the wheelchair, takes as big of a step as he can. His shoes get stuck. Then he takes off his shoes, takes as big a step as he can. Then he takes his His socks socks off. off. And then he takes, hopefully, a step into the elevator. Right? (laughs) Well, then I think the Medusa machine just works at anywhere in the castle and he'll just keep getting magneted to the floor. Damn it. (laughs) (laughs) He makes it the slowest walk he can make it ever. Because, okay, if he can walk, it, this is where it becomes important mm-hmm. because if it is different than Brad and Janet's uh, feet accessories getting stuck to the floor, but if Dr. Scott could try to overpower Frank and protect them all, but he's not that kind of guy, I don't think. I don't think Dr. Scott would have fought. I think he still is in scientist observation mode i need to he would get stuck on this ship and be okay with getting 
transported back to transsexual. Oh, yeah. And observing the aliens up close and in person full time. Definitely. That'd be his life's work. I think even if he weren't stuck, he would say he was stuck. <laughs> like oh no i uh, can't leave oh, this no. lab now i guess i'm gonna have to watch you guys keep a close eye on you frank responds to brad's realization with you are so quake with fear you tiny fools are transylvanians huge in comparison to humans Tiny fools. Because then Krim also refers to the human species as Ants. insects. Yeah. yeah. So is it that Transylvanians are larger than we could conceptualize them and they come down into tiny form, into human form? I don't like that. Yeah, I don't like that either. Because then you can, they could just crush them whenever they want. Yeah. I need to see a Transylvanian in their full... In true form. In their true form. Exactly. I liked what Susan said, that it's like the aliens from The Simpsons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like that. Janet's like, you want some Janet drama? Okay, I will. <gasps> We're trapped! <laughs> but this is her fault. Like, she's the one who ran up the stairs. Yeah. She kind of likes that they're trapped. <laughs> I think she likes the excitement. Like, even when I'm performing Janet, I try to keep it pretty light the whole way through. Mm -hmm. But I do think she gets seduced by the lifestyle. Yeah. And she's right on her way to becoming the next Columbia, the next groupie that's like, oh, Oh no, chase me, Frank. Chase me around the castle. <laughs> oh, I'm dramatic. Frank moves to her, bypassing Brad trying to swing at him. He says, it's something you'll get used to. A mental mindfuck can be nice. Also, this is the only F-bomb in this whole film, despite all of the foul language that you'll hear from the callback. <laughs> this is the only one that's actually in the movie. Which is glossed over. Oh, yeah. He says it so fast, you barely hear what he's talking about. And in a movie that's full of sexual intercourse, he is not referring to it in any way other than getting your mind blown Yep. by, like... The absurdity. Right, exa exactly. Talk about mental mind fucks. This is ultimately what drives us fans to invent improbable theories because the symbolism in this movie is used so heavily and never explained. The connections are not explained. <laughs> Plot developments are obscured like they're treated like silent films. Yeah. They treat those moments with the same weight as the moments that have dialogue. Mm -hmm. The whole movie could be non-chronological, for all I know. We could be getting a, a, a series of events that time warp and get mixed up out of order. Or there could just seriously be no ending. Yep. He says, get used to being trapped. I'm wondering if that's setting up shock treatment. Because... In shock treatment, they're trapped and forced to participate in a reality TV show. But then that made me start thinking that, is that what's just happening here at Frankenstein Castle? Like, I mean, is this just being a broadcast? Basically. Streamed live television event of Love Island, <laughs> Transylvania? It totally could be. It absolutely could be. Janet, yo! <laughs> because I think she still likes this. She's still like, ooh, fun song and dance numbers. Because she too didn't hear what Frank was saying to her because she was just like running really, really fast. <laughs> and we cut up to the hole in the wall again where Magenta, Riff Raff, Columbia, and Rocky all come in succession and lean against the observation bar to kind of see what's happening. Yeah. What's happening here. Because 
I think Columbia... Well, okay, do you think Riff Raff and Magenta walked up the stairs? Or do you think they teleported Transylvanian ship-shaped... Ship-shaped... <laughs> ship-shaped it? Ship... Ship... ship? No. Nope. No! Did they teleport into the lab? Or did they take the stairs? I think that they probably walked up the stairs and like made sure that Columbia and Rocky were like on their way as well because I think that they wanted everybody to be there for the show. Or do you think they knew Frank would fly off the handle and Medusa everyone in the house if they got them all back in the lab? I don't know if they knew that he was going to Medusa everybody but I, I think that they knew that this was kind of their moment to attempt their takeover and they were like we want an audience sure everybody in and as they come in dr scott he's like well we have nowhere to go so i might as well um confuse you guys more he says to frank you won't find earth people quite the easy mark you imagine this sonic transducer It is, I suppose, some kind of audio vibratory physiomolecular transport device. You mean! Yes, Brad. It's something we ourselves have been working on. But it seems our friend here has found means of perfecting it. As soon as Dr. Scott says audio vibratory, they've been looking at Frank... (laughs) <laughs> awkwardly because yes. they're not fa- Frank is like I don't even want you to look at me so and he walks behind them to sit on the tank behind them <laughs> so Brad and Dr. Scott are awkwardly pivoted to look behind them and deliver this to Frank and as soon as he says audio vibratory Brad breaks contact with Frank to look at Dr. Scott because he knows what Dr. Scott's talking about. Mm-hmm. And I always, because I was thinking about it, and it's like, how have I always interpreted this? If I'm not going to, like, assume that he's in on it. I I think that Brad is a doofus, and he's trying to be the know-it-all science student that's the know-it-all to his favorite science teacher (laughs) that like, oh, I remember you talking about this in class that one time that this was your passion to um, figure out how to teleport things, Dr. Scott. Oh, I remember. But I think Brad's in on it the whole time and that he's been working on a teleportation device with Dr. Scott. Yeah. Yeah. I totally think so as well. Dr. Scott literally says it's something we have been working on. And I thought that was the royal we. Like the American government. We've been working on the space program. We've been working on XYZ. Like, I I, thought that was him being... I don't know, though. I don't know, though. No, I do think you're right that it's... We, you and I, Brad, have been working on this. Because for some reason, Brad feels like very, very attached to Dr. Scott. I mean, Mm -hmm. he got engaged and immediately was like, let's go tell Dr. Scott. So, you know, I think that I think that their relationship is a little deeper than just teacher student. Mm -hmm. Because Brad is nodding emphatically as Dr. Scott mansplains it to him. So, okay, I need, I wanted to talk about what could possibly be an audio vibratory physiomolecular transport device. And what I thought of was, um, I don't know, cell phones and the radio and TV and film and the internet and digital photo libraries like literally your cell phone (laughs) audio vibratory because it's like they're talking about breaking down molecules like they're going to send them to another planet (laughs) but i don't think i think it's a maybe a red herring because well okay i'm getting ahead of myself yes on the commentary track 
Richard O'Brien and Pat talk about how there was a very surreal quality that made it feel dreamlike filming the movie because they'd been working on the show for so many years prior to filming that they really felt like the story was unfolding around them while they were filming it. Mm -hmm. I think that's just so interesting when you consider Richard and Tim's relationships and how they are very similar to their characters' relationships. (laughs) Well, and also the fact that Barry and Susan were brand new. They were babies Mm -hmm. in this this family. And outsiders. They didn't have the same chemistry and experience and time with anybody else on the cast. And it shows. It shows that they're not bonded the same way. Mm Mm-hmm. So Dr. Scott reveals that he and Brad are working together. We cut to Frank, who's sitting on the tank with Janet in the foreground, listening to Dr. Scott. She's like picking up what's being put down, listening, trying to pick up what she can. And Frank is like, ha 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 ha, at Scott. (laughs) Like, you, you think you've figured it out? It's not like I laid it all out for you or anything. And he doesn't seem worried that Dr. Scott is making these kinds of claims. Yeah. It makes me think that Dr. Scott has no idea what he's talking about. (laughs) Well, I think it's more of Frank doesn't have any plans to let them leave at this point. Mm -mm. He's like, I don't care if you've figured it out. You're not getting out anyways. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Dr. Scott continues to describe what this device might be. A device which is capable of breaking down solid matter and then projecting it through space, and who knows, perhaps even time itself. And I had always interpreted this as, like, literal teleportation Mm -hmm. until I had read through Haley's notes, which were like, maybe it's just literally projecting images Mm -hmm. projecting that's the key word and i was like mind totally blown because i had always thought of like teleportation yeah because it's like so teleportation could be managed by dematerializing someone Mm -hmm. putting them so like star trek when they like beam someone up or like wormholes could cause teleportation or space time bends yes and this all raises so many questions about metaphysics because what is reality (laughs) i need to know i feel like this is what the question that (laughs) this podcast has been coming to that's one of the main theories we're trying to analyze (laughs) what what is reality when like exactly if a device is capable my cell phone is capable of projecting the rocky horror picture show onto it and i can watch it anywhere in the world whenever i want um at any time with anybody yep and if you enjoy movies the way i do i feel teleported (laughs) to the time and place of when it was created and really feel like it's a capsule of what's happening in history at that time. Um, Or even like, you know, you watch a movie for the first time, you watch Rocky Horror for the first time, and anytime you watch a movie again, you're reminded of the last time you watched it, Mm -hmm. and you can be put back in the same mental physiological, emotional state (laughs) as the last time you watched that movie. Yeah. So that's projecting through time and space. True. I think it's also bringing up the idea that, like, aliens don't need to abduct people anymore to probe them. Like, you can literally just project someone onto your home planet. Yes, yes, because... If they've just been observing Brad and Janet the whole time and they're sending information back to their home species on their home planet, like, that would explain why they're breaking the fourth wall all the time. That's why they would know they're being filmed is, hey, we know we have a live studio audience back home that's 
seeing who Frank is going to give his rose to <laughs> at the end of this. Is it is it Rocky? Is it Janet? Is it Brad? Find out who the prince marries in this season of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. You yep. know? You also, because you said teleportation, like they are going to transport them to another space. Mm-hmm. And you originally, I like that you brought it up because they don't teleport the castle. No. At the end of the movie, they do not. They fly away. Any kind of like cloaking mechanism. No. Or anything. <laughs> so I I was thinking like, do Riff and Magenta not know how this technology works? They Do they not know how to work the teleportation device Ooh. because they fly away? Or I think they, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe there's so many Transylvanians on Earth already that, like, them taking off at the end... Doesn't matter. Yeah, the odds of a human (laughs) seeing that and knowing what that is and being like, oh, that's not... That's a weird blip in the sky. (laughs) So at this point, Janet falls forward and, like, puts her hand on Dr. Scott's shoulder because Brad is on the other side and he has also leaned over to put his hand on Dr. Scott's shoulder. Which, by the way, if if we're shadow casting, I always manage to get just a little bit too far away uh-huh. from Dr. Scott and have to basically bend my entire body in half to be able to put my hand on his shoulder to without moving my feet. Yes. <laughs> but now Janet does her own uh, shaping the narrative, she says, you mean he's gonna send us to another planet? And first of all, I give her props because if they are abducting her, if this is Janet, had no idea they were aliens, had no idea what was happening when Brad took them to the castle, claiming he was looking for a telephone, and if she's putting it together that they're aliens and there's a transport device. She figures it out really fast after being left in the dark the entire rest of the movie. Mm -hmm. And she also doesn't mansplain it. (laughs) She just straight up is like, states the fact. You mean he's gonna send us to another planet? Can you stop beating around the bush, Dr. Scott, and using your fancy schmancy science terms? (laughs) Frank, at this point, has absolutely had it. He (laughs) jumps down off the tank, onto the floor, goes over to Janet, and says, Planet, Schmanet, Janet. (laughs) As he booty bumps her. (laughs) She gets, like, knocked off balance. And (laughs) I will never understand how anybody does this without moving their feet at all. (laughs) I always have to, like, shift my weight. (laughs) Core, I use my core strength. I'm like, no, no, don't you move. Don't you get knocked off balance. And Audrey's, like, doing the Frank hip thing. And I'm like, help. Standing still. Gotta do it. Help. (laughs) Um, And I think this is Frank directly addressing that them being aliens is a red herring. And that it's, it was never in the plan to abduct anybody. Mm-hmm. And they can conduct all of the experimentation they want right there under civilians' noses for years and years and years and years. Mm-hmm. I also think that's also why none of the experimentation matters after the bedroom scenes. Because if Janet's supposed to be pregnant, then Frank is like, Planet, Schmanet, Janet, you're not go. I don't need you to go anywhere. Yeah. You're part of it, baby. I love that Richard O'Brien originally wanted the three who've been stuck to the floor mm-hmm. to start getting, like, this, like, glowy light around them and that they would start disintegrating and, like, dissolving and, like... <laughs> That maybe Frank is going to go store them in a vault somewhere in the house. He's Mm -hmm. just like, suck them back somewhere. (laughs) Frank is circling Janet, touching her thighs. He's like, he's just poking at her, tickling her, 
prodding her. He snaps her bra straps and he keeps telling her, you better wise up, Janet Weiss. You better wise up, Janet Weiss. Build your thighs up. You better wise up. He kiss just cannot stop warning her. And she's not exactly not into it. Yeah, she's like feisty, but in like a fun way. Yeah, and if she's being polite, then we all know she should fuck politeness. Mm -hmm. And that if she's truly uncomfortable by Frank, like I know her, her feet are stuck. But she's not protesting in the same way she wasn't protesting on the landing of the stairs. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, Krim shows up. Like, why? Okay. Center divide opens like he's breaking the fight up. (laughs) He kind of gets right in the middle of Brad and Janet. He says, Then she cried out. Then we get another white transition of a spiral outward circle like clockwise outward circle that matches susan's tossing her hair and (laughs) it just makes it all feel so frenzied (laughs) like everything's stop 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 (laughs) which is exactly what happens as she cries out stop crim cuts in to report why? Why does he interject? <laughs> the only thing I can think is if this is a factual part of the statement that at some point Janet did tell him to stop. To me, it feels like the princess bride when like the grandpa is telling a story and he it'll cut to him and he's like, don't worry, this part's not that scary, <laughs> you know, or whatever, like. I mean, that's what I'm going to skip this part. They're kissing. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's like he cuts in to like tell you that it's an important piece of the story. Sure. Yeah. Because she screams loud and long enough to catch Frank off guard. He Mm -hmm. staggers and falls backward onto the control panel ladder area. Brad is also now trying to be a dominant protector. Yeah. After he abandoned her to go find the lab. Mm-hmm. And now that his feet are stuck and he... Can't really actually can't. do anything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so convenient of him. But Brad and Janet both do this, like, mirrored fight choreography with their arms. You just gotta watch it. You gotta watch them doing the same thing at the same time. It's like their audition for West Side Story. And behind them... Riff Raff and Magenta are already at the control panel. You see them kind of move in the background down the ramp when Dr. Scott is giving his projection monologue. (laughs) And Frank has his moment of recomposure. And then he snaps back into it. He says, don't get hot and flustered. Use a bit of mustard. (laughs) And if we were shadow casting this scene, I love this scene too. Same. Really gets the heart rate going (laughs) because I've been running all over the house. And we'll be, you know, spaced out across the stage. We'll have Frank Medusa everybody and as soon as they're done um we run as fast as possible <laughs> backstage because this is my fastest it's quick change. such a quick change and like oh boy i pre prep all of my floor show everything i like lay it out so that when i run back there i can just like slip into everything yeah frank will exit as he does Riff and Magenta will do their little do their little uh, Transylvanian space dance salute. Their little, yeah, <laughs> Transylvanian salute uh, over Doctor Scott. It's a pretty simple scene, honestly. My biggest piece of advice for anybody who is playing any of the floor show characters: 
put a zipper in your floor shore corset. It makes that quick change happen so much easier. Mm -hmm. And it makes it easier for folks who are like costume assistants Mm -hmm. in the back. Anybody who's helping. uh Uh-huh. Just to, you're in, you're good to go, and then you can worry about your fishnets getting clasped to your garter belt because that do uh, you unclasp them every time no okay they will sometimes just come undone yeah you know because i know some because people they hate me do undo them every time and i'm like leave them attached what no, are you, you doing what? i think i'm gonna tie them now that i think about it i think i'm gonna tie them and then clasp it mm. because yeah, nobody looks that close no. And that way they will not go anywhere. But I'll also put my floor show, uh, like, fishnets. I'll, like, pre-roll them and put them in my heel, over my heel. Oh, okay. So I know what direction I'm putting them on so the garter belt's <laughs> in the right direction. Like, I really try to get it as quick of a... Honestly, Colombians have the easiest time here. I don't, I've probably said it before, but since you're wearing long sleeve pajamas, long leg pajamas, what I do is I wear my floor show corset underneath the pajama top. Mm -hmm. I I wear my garter belt and my underwear under the pajama bottoms, and I actually have the feet um, cut open on the bottom, and Mm -hmm. I push them up. So I just have to push them down and then Such tuck them under my feet in my sho- in my heels and everything's ready to go. So basically all I have to do is take off my pajamas, mm-hmm. top layer, and then put on my gauntlets, put on my shoes and I'm ready to go. What about Brad? Because so like for Janet, I have my black silk panties under my white. I do the same thing. And then it's just having to put everything on on top of it yep and crim's monologue is long-ish it's it's a it's a decent amount plus you have the little bit of time where frank is prepping all of the statues at the last second uh and believe me those like 10 seconds really help oh my gosh yes (laughs) oh my gosh yes otherwise we see magenta start to kind of groove with the music. I don't know if that means she's heard this song before or if she knows she clearly knows what's coming. Yes. Because she's at the switch at the ready. Do you think Frank Medusa's like this is when I really start to ask if the other statues in the house are past kidnap victims? I mean they definitely could be. Does he re Medusa them after the floor show is over and then just use them as decorations. But this time he didn't get to do it because Riff and Magenta took over. Mm -hmm. You know? And that's why they were able to lay such a seamless plan. Because they knew exactly what was going to (laughs) happen. Yeah, it happens often enough that, okay, beat by beat we can predict exactly what Frank is going to do with these people that have stumbled upon the castle. So... Great. I'm ready. I'm re- I'm ready, Frank. You just need to nod your head whenever you're ready. <laughs> in, 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 anything to read into with all the food puns? <laughs> you know? I mean, it's it's a hot dog joke time. Because Frank and Furter, they've been, <laughs> you know, they've been holding on to this one for a long time. Yeah, they haven't said his name for 75% of the movie, so now they're like... <laughs> it's time to bust out all the hot dog yeah. puns. What's it called? End loading? Back ending? <laughs> Back loading? Yeah. <laughs> All, All the jokes. Just cramming them, them in, in the there. rear. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just, I don't know because I also think about how shock treatment is mysteriously produced by a fast Ooh. food, like. Yeah, Farley flavors. Conglomerate. Or maybe not. He may not be a... He might be a local businessman that's trying to put Denton on the map. A creep. (laughs) Could be the same person that is standing in front of Frankenfurter right now. Ooh. But what is... uh, What does Brad 
say to Frank, You're a hot dog, but you'd better not try to hurt her, Frank Furter. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like everyone to sing along. I these know. Are, these are key. You're in the audience. And it's kind of like the Rocky Roll Call where, because they say it more than once, you can get in on the joke mm-hmm. before it ends. We see Frank as Brad is landing his insult, <laughs> which is nowhere near as good as Frank's sick burns. <laughs> Just, you're a hot dog. That's the best insult you can come up with. Not like, you're an alien. Nope, you're a hot dog, man. (laughs) You're a total freaking hot dog, dude. But Frank is just raising his chin ever so slightly. Ever so slightly. Ever so slightly. And it's almost like he's measuring for, for Brad to hit the right pose. Yeah. You know? I mean, if he's done this a bunch of times, then he knows how to measure it correctly. Yeah, because, and also, Brad's been swinging at him. Mm -hmm. So, he's seeing that this is the most dynamic tension Brad has been giving this whole movie. Like, the most effort he's exuded. Yeah, honestly. (laughs) In one place. And he gets medusa yeah. He just, I, I don't know what else to say other than that silly sentence, which is Brad gets medusa He turns to complete stone. He's now a nude Greek statue <laughs> uh, after Magenta so gleefully throws the, the switch. And these, the sequence of shots, oh, oh, chef's kiss. So good. Because you get the... It's so sci-fi. And just in case anybody doesn't get the Medusa reference, uh, Medusa was a Gorgon, which in Greek mythology is a creature... She has snakes for hair, and when you look at her, she turns you into stone. Not that deep of a reference, but just in case anyone was not aware where that term came from... This is just now a whole bunch of sci-fi goobled de gook <laughs> This is also the last scene that we're going to be in this beautiful pink laboratory. And you don't realize how much time you spend in the lab. Yeah, it's also the last time that they're going to be mm-hmm. in the pink laboratory. Yes, it gets destroyed (laughs) (laughs) yeah they completely (laughs) took it apart because it became the ballroom where they do the floor show so yes because they needed somewhere to put a pool so unfortunately this beautiful lab does not even exist anymore but in this lab it reliably fits the trope for a mad scientist's laboratory For all of the equipment, uh, including an operating tank, a roof opening to the sky to let lightning in for power, Mm -hmm. dusty piles of incomprehensible failed experiments, maybe. (laughs) And then, you know, a giant wall of big levers and control panels. Oh, totally. After we get the... of of Medusa magic, Frank... Then keeps moving to Dr. Scott. I, do you, does Dr. Scott realize that Brad got Medusa? Because it happened so fast that I'm like... He doesn't even look at him. No. No. Like, Janet seems to be getting more and more nervous, but uh-huh. Dr. Scott does... He's, like, so focused on Frank. Yeah, because Janet is fiddling with those two long strips on her slip. Um... Realizing that the person she came here with is now a statue. So, you know, screwed. (laughs) Like, how is she going to explain that one when she gets back to Denton? You know, I, my boyfriend went missing. He turned into a marble statue Statue. thing in the middle of nowhere. (laughs) What? (laughs) Dr. Scott, now that he's being 
faced by Frankenfurter. By his arch rival <laughs> scientist. His his arch nemesis. Dr. Scott could have been thinking about what he wanted to say to Frankenfurter after all this time. And he can't think up anything other than what Brad just said. You're a hot dog, but you better not try to hurt her, Frankfurter. Well, unless Dr. Scott knows about the experiment that Frank is really conducting, which is trying to impregnate Janet. Yeah, because they both are only concerned with Janet's safety. But Brad's coming at it from a, a place of like, I saw you just slap her a minute ago. Yeah. And, ooh, ah, man, me man, need to protect me woman, you know? Versus Dr. Scott, if he's saying, like, this might be the last words he gets to say to Frank, because he doesn't, if he does see Brad get medusa I don't know if he understands this strange science either. And is like, oh, we'll be out of this in a couple, we'll defrost, <laughs> or we can find, figure our way out of this. Like, no, when they get, like, they're, like, I just, it's like, they're so trapped as statues. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, on such the, a level that, like. They're even more trapped than Eddie is, or was, in yes. the freezer. Right, exactly. At least Eddie had a door out. Like, they're in, like, the sunken place Ugh. in Get Out. You Yuck. know? If they're even... I was thinking, too, what is happening in Brad and Janet and Dr. Scott's heads while they're being medusa mm -hmm. And if they're feeling, like, drug effects. Ooh. Which is why they come out of... They come out of it so enlightened to their situ I don't know their situations <laughs> each individual one of them their unique traumas <laughs> but yeah if Dr. Scott is being like we're getting turned to stone Janet may be on her on her own on this one or do you think Dr. Scott is like cool Medusa me take me back to Transylvania I'm down with <laughs> with studying for 40 more years. I don't know, man. I don't know. Dr. Scott's a weird one. Hmm. I don't think he's in a real rush to leave. <laughs> but once again, Frank nods his head. Magenta throws that lever. And Dr. Scott also becomes a statue. This one confuses me, though. <laughs> because he has the blanket over his lap. He's not it's fully a, nude. It's a stone blanket. So <laughs> how come he gets... To keep the blanket on his lap. Because they needed to be tasteful. Also, do you think that the... I don't know. I think the fishnets in the floor show. Like, him... How did they put the fishnets on if he has a stone blanket on his lap? <laughs> <laughs> Help. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that, though. That's a good point. <gasps> Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, okay, 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 okay. What if, that actually brings up a really good point. If he's under the blanket, it's not like they can put, well, also, they're on plinths. Plinths, as Richard O'Brien says over and over in the commentary. And he brings up a good point. It, it It's one of those uh, universe consistency things of like, None of the rest of the statues are on plinths, but somehow these Medusa statues are on plinths. And they're not standing on a platform, but now they are on a platform. Yeah. So, like, I, I get, I get, I get it. And it's also, like, how could he put fishnets on a statue that has a plinth? <laughs> you know? Yeah. But I was going to say, Dr. Scott with... A, a stone blanket, right? Mm -hmm. If that means what that means, and Frankenfurter didn't put Dr. Scott in any kind of floor show stuff, because he's not. He's just wearing 
he gets unmeduced and then he's back in his like coat yeah and tie. Does that mean Dr. Scott is secretly wearing fishnets under the blanket always? And that's the real shock of it. That's is the that real he, kicker. Yeah, is that he didn't need to be transformed. <laughs> Ooh, I'm going to think about that. But I had I hadn't thought about this blanket being stone. It's a good idea. Frank now moves over to Janet. Her hands in her hair, distressed. You're a hot dog! She doesn't even get to finish the insult. (laughs) He's like, I don't want to hear it. (laughs) Frank nods again. Magenta flips that switch. And she becomes stone too. You know who else just can't take any more of this? Columbia. My main girl. My god, I can't take any more of this. Frank is like, oh, what? Oh, yeah, there's other people in this house. I forgot. I forgot. I thought, oh, boy, too many of people, too many humans running around here right now. (laughs) And poor Columbia, she has been... The cutie that was broken. the, The groupie. She's been, like, a fan of Frank's decisions so far. And... Well, I was talking about the the trope, the break Uh the cutie trope. Yes, because she is at her breaking point right now. Mm -hmm. And she's been holding back for some reason and is now snapped. But is she afraid of the, like, consequences of speaking up to Frank? I think at this point she's seeing that the consequences, you either get murdered like Eddie, or you get turned to stone, like Brad and Janet and Dr. Scott. So she's kind of like... do you think she's seen other people get medusa too? I don't know if she has. Because I also like the thought of her being there and being relatively shielded from all of the alien stuff. Yeah, I like that that idea as well. Yeah, and her extent of... of, All she knows is that they have, like secret surveillance all over the castle and that they can they're messing around with science in the lab Mm -hmm. but i like that if she's like walked into the lab after missing every other insane part of this movie that she's like oh my gosh this is too much to handle i what you were turning people to stone what yeah hold on We cut up to Columbia, who was next to Rocky, who's just very concerned, (laughs) looking down at the people who he has known since birth. Yeah. (laughs) Turned to stone. So now he's very confused. And Columbia launches off of her, like, poolside ladder thing. The red ladder that we haven't seen anybody use as a ladder. (laughs) No, it's solely for Nell to hang on and off of and around and launch (laughs) off of. Um, And she starts monologuing to Frank as she moves down the ramp behind the elevator. First you spurn me for Eddie, then you cast him off like an old overcoat for Rocky. You chew people up and then you spit them out again. And she's giving such a good like girlfriend lecture of like I'm gonna do all of the hand gestures you're she's just like flinging her hands wildly Mm -hmm. and let's go over Frank's sequence of hookups yeah so he met Columbia yes according to Columbia's story he met Columbia first Mm -hmm. and then he dumped Columbia for Eddie and then he dumped Eddie for Rocky What she doesn't know is then he hooked up with Janet after Rocky and then Brad after Janet. Like, I don't... Oh my gosh, yeah. I always just think there's a universal awareness of it all. But yeah, Columbia only knows really that Janet and Rocky hooked up. Mm -hmm. So that means Frank is the guy in the pickup truck. It could. It totally could. Because it's still, with that sequence of events, 
Eddie and Columbia could still have been together, dating, interested on the outside of the castle. Columbia could have been why Eddie went to the castle. And Columbia lays into the trope, the reason you suck speech, <laughs> and just lists every single why reason why she is upset, RN. She's stumbling along the wall. She says, I loved you. Do you hear me? I loved you. And what did it get me? I'll tell ya, a big nothing. You're like a sponge. You take, 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 and drain others of their love and emotion. Frank's like, what is love? Baby, don't hurt me. <laughs> don't hurt me. No more. Because he's like, what? Yeah. What do you mean love? I didn't say anything about looking for love here. Frank I was... seems totally taken aback by this entire speech. He's like, uh, excuse me? And he's also, not a single one of his lines, motivations, uh, facial expressions, Mm -mm. not a single one has said anything about desiring love, and it's more about undying loyalty, and good genetic traits, and sexual compatibility, and it's like a much more animalistic approach to pursuing humans Mm -hmm. than a more human approach to pursuing humans but columbia is like stockholm syndrome central yeah is she do you think she's been kidnapped i don't know if it's that she's been kidnapped i think that maybe she stumbled into this situation and now she is um not being kept against her will but kind of being uh persuaded not to leave Kind of in, like, a culty sense. Okay. Yeah, I mean, she's very close to the inner workings of the castle. Yeah. I I think maybe it might have been Austin had said that Columbia is also hooked on the drug that Eddie is delivering, mm-hmm. which would make it very hard for her to leave this situation, yeah. too. And okay, what do you think about Frank being, like, an energy vampire in the sense that, like, he's, like, but in a more physio sense where it's, like, he is actively draining the human's emotions? Totally. I mean, do you think that like that's a that's a thing? I think that might be why he keeps luring more and more people in. Is because once he's kind of drained them and gotten them to join his little, you know, cult, Mm -hmm. he has to get more people. And he's seems to be devoid of love and emotion. And that also seems to be something the Transylvanians are observing humans for. Yeah. Is... Their relationships. Yeah, and how they experience love and how they experience emotion. Mm -hmm. And how, wow, emotions are high in this household right now. (laughs) Um, I was also thinking, I keep going back to Nell speculating that Columbia is pregnant. Which is if her hormones are going crazy haywire. That would make sense why she's, like, finally standing up to Frank if she's, like... And why she's interpreting their relationship as, like, love. Uh Uh-huh. If she is pregnant by his baby, do you think? Or, Or Eddie's. I mean, either way, it's like, well, you murdered possibly the father of my child, so he needs a father figure. I thought it was gonna be you, but now you're doing all this crazy shit. You're an alien? <laughs> I can just... Columbia being like, wait, what? <laughs> you know what I mean, though? Like, yeah, it was the 70s. Yeah. A baby needs a dad. Yeah. She continues. Yeah, well, I've had enough. You've got to choose between me and Rocky, so named after the rocks in his head. <laughs> Love her. Love that sassafras, Columbia, because she's so sensitive and, like, your heart is breaking for her because she is, 
like finally someone is putting a stop to all of the madness after dr scott arrived and just made everything worse she (laughs) decides to give a sociopath um ultimatum yes while also giving a little a little peekaboo nip slip (laughs) that's just classic now oh yeah and pat on the commentary you just need to listen to her describe how nell absolutely knew there was a hole in that pajama shirt (laughs) and it was planned and though she knew she was always a flasher that girl (laughs) says pat and if you watch other little nell videos you will definitely see her nipples again if you just like search photos of her in the 70s and 80s when she's like going to red carpets and stuff you will see her nipples again and hey again. fuck yeah i love it I, it's like so edgy and like nell said free the nipple before free the nipple was a thing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. fuck so cool <laughs> and she's insulting rocky's intelligence with i mean good reason he's not exactly um doing much (laughs) he's not holding many conversations let's say but doesn't that also mean that she's insulting eddie's intelligence i think so because i think she mourned and moved on during eddie's teddy Mm. because i think she's been sad girling all night like oh my gosh i can't believe that i just saw that Mm. which also I can't believe Columbia doesn't leave after that. Seriously. That she doesn't realize that if this was just like the fun place that we do tap dancing on Saturday nights, like, oh shit, no, he's murdering people now. I need to get out of here. Yeah. Like, she's in so deep that she still hasn't left. I think she, in Eddie's Teddy, is like, cool, well... Whatever Frank was insinuating, like, he's definitely dead. That wasn't just a surface wound that we saw a river of blood pouring out of the refrigerator from. And she's, like, trying to be vulnerable with Frank. Mm Mm-hmm. But he's just... He's a sociopath. He's the worst. You know, he looks at her and he's like, I don't even know what I want to say to you right now. So I'm not even going to say anything to anybody. I'm just going to turn around and look at Magenta over there who's still ready. She's still ready to flip that switch. And he gives another head nod. We get a quick flip to Columbia now being a statue. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he was planning on medusing, medusa-ing her. Yeah. Because he thinks about it for a second. It's like a more of a beat Mm -hmm. in between his decision as opposed to Brad and Janet and Dr. Scott. Yeah, there's enough room for the callback. Oh shit, what a bitch. Quick, magenta, flip that switch. And that bust is famous for uh, making it out of production (laughs) and making it onto some random fans. Isn't it in someone's garden? I, does Pat talk about it in the commentary? I think, I think so. Some could just, I just... Someone owns it. No. I would bring it out for birthday parties and make that, like, my birthday present to you is you can take a picture next to it. Pin the nipples on the nail? <laughs> that should be a... Okay. That is missing on the market right now. <laughs> that is... That, that could be a bachelorette party game. And... This makes me question Magenta's emotional ties to Columbia because she's not exactly affected by Columbia's speech that she's just given. Yeah, like I said before, I think that their friendship is situational. I -hmm. think it's, you're the only other chick in the house, so I guess I'm going to hang out with you. Mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I also like to think that maybe a little bit she gets inspired by her. A little bit. A little bit. And that's why she 
like double whammies, Frank. Ugh. He just really is like so overwhelmed. Like everyone needs to stop what they're doing <laughs> right now. He turns to face the camera again. He hasn't broken the fourth wall for a little while. We've gotten we had Doctor Scott breaking the fourth wall at at the dinner scene. Mm-hmm. Frank tells us in the audience, "It's not easy having a good time." <laughs> he looks up to the ramp where Rocky is posing like he knows what's coming. Frank nods again, and we cut back to Rocky as a statue. And it's a instant one frame of Medusa blink. He becomes a statue. Frank continues, even smiling makes my face ache. Frank is like the eternal whiny diva that like <laughs> yeah it is hard having a good time Look, when everything's all you want... going wrong and i'm being terrible but i don't know why things are terrible when i'm being terrible he goes after sexual stimulation in the most sexually repressed species on the planet like it wasn't gonna be an easy walk in the park for him and he's also treating this with very little um, awareness to consequences. Yes. I'm wondering, I'm wondering. The statue of Discobulus was beheaded by, I think it's Henry Wolf during Hot Patootie. So, like, if Frank damaged any of these statues in transit to the floor show... Are they, like... Done for? Done for? Right. Exactly. I'm curious at how reversible this Medusa thing is because it's such... It's nonsense science. Yeah. It's absurd. I, was, I just kept thinking about this line of Frank's and how it's like the interview moments on The Bachelor <laughs> where he's like... Oh, yeah, the date with Sarah today was really good, but, oh, man, I don't know where my heart's at. <laughs> like, that's what it sounds like. It's, it feels like Frank is addressing an, uh, an at-home audience as a contestant on a reality show. It's so meta. Frank walks to the red refrigerator door, which After gives us... biting his knuckle in absolute <laughs> agony. Which gives us this, like, really nice, like, dramatic backdrop. Uh-huh. And he says, And my children turn on me. Rocky's behaving just as Eddie did. Do you think I made a mistake in splitting his brain between the two of them? Frank is just oh, having his moment on his refrigerator door. He's He does the thing that he references in the interview that he does, uh, the behind-the-scenes interview that's, like, really famous, where he talks about facial expressions for film versus stage. Mm -hmm. And he talks about doing the eargasm thing and how he was really excited to be able to do that for the film because... It's a smaller gesture than he'd be able to do on stage mm -hmm. and have it be readable. Right, exactly. And while he's giving this lament, we cut to Riff and Magenta, who are like, he does this every week. <laughs> every week. He, like, I'm so tired of him, like, pretending that this is new. Like, we're so bored by him. You know? Yeah. They're like just... Magenta's almost taking a nap. She totally is. And Frank is also just laid out all of it that... Yeah, this is when we like really get the like full-on scoop that he definitely took Eddie's brain and put half of it into Rocky's head. This is when we get the for sure answer that that's what he did. But it gets inferred to so many times before this mm -hmm. that you get it 
in a shadow cast theater because people keep pointing out the like Easter egg hints and setups. It makes so much sense the second time you watch it. And you're like, oh, that's why Eddie had the scar on his head. And that's why they are not on stage for this, for, like, they can't be on, he gets killed off so fast because you can't have both of them running around, (laughs) I guess. But are you ready for Haley's tinfoil corner? So... Frank said, my children, mm-hmm. multiple, mm-hmm. turn on me. Mm-hmm. And this is where Haley went a little bit off the rails. Can you please explain this theory to me? <laughs> well, he's also, I think, in a, a little bit referring to Columbia. Because, like, she's my groupie. Like, my follower, my child, my my chosen one. <laughs> like, they all have turned on me. How did it turn so fast? But, just like, seriously, what are the possibilities of Frank being Eddie's dad? (laughs) Because in Eddie's Teddy, a father figure is markedly absent from his backstory. And I'm just wondering if Scott could be saying, we need it last because Frank is his sister's baby daddy. Mm -hmm. And that's why, like, Frank is in shock. When it's like, oh, there's a family tie. It's not just, like... Business. Yeah, because they could have been rival scientists all that time. Mm -hmm. And fuck it. Like, Dr. Scott, if he's ruthless, if he's sending Eddie there to be bait, and Brad and Janet there to be bait, like, who's to say he's not out for selling out his own sister? Yeah. And sending her over to Frankenstein Place and seeing what happens to her when she goes over there... And then she gets knocked up by Frank, and then it's like Frank thinking he invented procreation when he, <laughs> because then it make then I'm thinking like Proud Dad has pictures of Eddie all over the His castle, house, yeah, because he's been watching him for all this time and he's been observing him, and that's why he comes back to Earth. To, like, replicate his experiment because he's, like, it was a successful first experiment and I've been observing Eddie all this time. I feel a little dizzy only because I think I didn't breathe for the last five (laughs) five minutes thinking about that. Um, Magenta is sick of my ridiculous theory and is also sick of Frank. She screams at him. I grow weary of this world. She enters the scene, and it's so good because you don't see Tim Curry meet his match very often in this. Yeah. And this is like two lions, like, circling each other (laughs) and about to pounce. Like, he turns to look at her is so shocked that Magenta, like, this is what's coming out of Magenta right now. After this whole movie, she's been silent. And she does not like Frank enough to listen to all of his problems. She enters onto the red door, followed by Riff Raff closely behind her. She asks, When shall we return to Transylvania, huh? Huh, huh, huh. Stay alive. Staying alive. <laughs> and she speaks. She speaks. Yeah. She, she hasn't. Hasn't. In a really long time. Since Time Warp. Yeah. And as a domestic, she has displayed the maximum level of patience that she is able to give Frank. And Riff is stroking her upper arm immediately as soon as she's walked into the into the frame he's like no 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 shh, shh, shh. not yet not yet sister everything's going to plan remember the plan <laughs> pat is in profile and is so gorgeous patricia quinn uh, is so beautiful i just needed to i just needed to say it again because <laughs> 
so beautiful. Frank crosses his arms very defensively and responds, Magenta, I am indeed grateful to both you and your brother Riffraff. You've both served me well. Loyalty such as yours shall not go unrewarded. You'll discover that when the mood takes me, I can be quite generous. And this is the first reveal that Riff and Magenta are siblings? Mm Mm-hmm. Which then you're like, oh, that explains why they're so close. And then you go, wait a second. Wait a second. They were like too close. They were doing like Dracula kissing earlier. Like, (laughs) uh, uh, squicky. (laughs) And Frank is saying served him like they're not employees. Do you know what I mean? Like, no, we're on a job. We're doing a mission together. I thought we were working on this experiment together. Mm-hmm. Like, but th- then there we go, the, like, sci-fi trope of Master and Igor. Yeah. It's um, also totally, like, gaslighty and gross. <laughs> and I hate it. Well, because he has mood-swinging generosity, which is a double negative. You know? Like, <laughs> mood-swinging generosity does not exist. No. <laughs> Like, that's just ridiculous expectations. And I don't know if that's Frank trying to be nice and uh, repair the relationship, or if he's re-solidifying their alien alliance of, like, I know I kind of flew off the handle back there, but at least I got all the humans wrangled, (laughs) right? Magenta is leaning back throughout all of Frank's speech nobody's listening to him talk neither of them are listening to him talk this is solely for frank's own amusement yeah they're riff and magenta are just staring into each other's eyes Mm -hmm. and in the original script magenta is like giving frank a neck massage and at this point she starts to like throttle him and like dig her nails into his skin And she responds, I ask for nothing, master. But it's like, I ask for nothing. (coughs) Master. Master. (laughs) Because she hasn't asked for anything at all. Magenta has been... Silent. A perfect employee. She's shown up for the job she... Uh, was told to do, which is collect the f- the garments, help with dinner, observe the creation. And, like, she's not really who lets Rocky loose. She, like, is observing it. But Magenta is really, like, she would rather they continue doing their job so that the mission can complete and they can go home because... Even for her, life is bigger than this mission, Mm -hmm. which is so interesting because we only see Magenta on this mission. You know, I make it makes me really wonder what could happen in another movie if we got to see more of of Transylvania. (laughs) You know, if we got to go to this other planet and see what what it's like. (sighs) Patricia Quinn calls this. The slowest burn you've ever seen, and the longest take of a look that killed Tim Curry. (laughs) And apparently she had no idea she was sexy. Yeah, she, like, in the commentary, is so taken aback that people think that she was sexy in this movie. And it's like, hello. Have you seen yourself? Um, hmm? Hmm? She's wearing a negligee. Like, (laughs) she's so... I said it earlier. Say it again. So gorgeous. And Frank realizes, oh, you want to, you think you can be sassy? Well, you shall receive it in abundance. And slams his hands on the fridge door, storms off toward the elevator lift. And the mood took him. He's uh, generous, I guess, with nothing. And (laughs) Riff these are the moments too where it's like Richard O'Brien is also a great character actor like 
he's able to switch like trains of thought in his head and character motivations so fast. Mm -hmm. I don't know how else to describe it. Like you see he's locked in on Magenta and as soon as Frank storms off, he's like a different character. And Frank says, come, Come. we are ready for the floor show and slams the lift gate behind him. But all this and a floor show? We're lucky. We're so lucky. You're lucky, and I'm lucky, and everybody's lucky. <laughs> and he is ordering Riff and Magenta around right now, but oh, how the roles will change. Little does he know. Mm. Riff and Magenta then break the fourth wall, or do they? Or do they not? Because <laughs> they look like they're watching the elevator descend, and they're making sure Frank gets completely out of view before they go and don't do any of what he just asked because they're actually going to go get ready for takeover. They're going to go change into their Flash Gordon gold numbers. Yes. Or they're aware they're being filmed. And they're they're staring right in the camera. And they're telling the audience at home, hey, this is when someone's getting voted off the island. It's coming. Get ready. they... At, because they're now left alone, they move slowly over. Uh, Riff leads Magenta by the hand over to Dr. Scott, specifically. They do their Transylvanian salute of elbow copulation over <laughs> his head. And then they kind of walk, and then they sprint up the ramp. But because it's that mid- like that floor that's so slippery and pats in those heels like yeah she really needs to huff it to like keep up with oh yeah Richard who's like out of there so I love this I love the Medusa scene I love Columbia's monologue and it's really one of those okay well what what happens now like literally what's gonna happen to characters that just got turned into statues How could this movie get any more unexplainable? (laughs) Um, We get a voiceover of criminologist. And so, by some extraordinary coincidence. And we get a clockwise circular wipe into the crim's study. He continues, fate, it seems had decided that Brad and Janet should keep that appointment with their friend, Dr. Everett Scott. As Richard O'Brien says, Charlie, fabulous Charlie. (laughs) Charles Gray. He is so... Ah, ah, ah. Let's talk about him. Honestly, such an incredible actor. Like... Mm -hmm. Has such presence. Mm -hmm. And he feels like he's part of the madness. And I forget that he is by himself Mm -hmm. the whole movie. Mm -hmm. You know? And I also appreciate Krim as a character for providing breaks in the narrative. And I think he's just such a good narrator. He, Charles Gray as Krim... He's so straight-faced. He tells it to you like a trained detective. And he has a captivating voice. Mm -hmm. Totally captivating. But then he's also the straight man that you can... That There's so many good callbacks for Krim. And (laughs) oh my gosh, so fun to watch. Like so many good jokes come out of Krim. And it's because he is not right in the middle of the insanity Mm -hmm. um but charles gray was born donald gray in 1928 and was aged 46 at the time of this filming this is literally blowing my mind i can't believe that he attended burnham burnhamouth bournemouth bournemouth school during World War II. 
uh, which is a boarding school for children between the ages of 11 and 18. Some of his friends and classmates remember his bedroom walls being covered in photos of different film stars. So in his mid-twenties, he left his desk job to pursue his dream of becoming an actor. His first performance in The Bose Stratagem left everyone surprised at the quality of his performance, including himself. He was like, what? He was like, oh, I can act? This is fun. I like this. And this spurred him to change his name to Charles because there was already another actor at the time named Donald Gray and didn't want to have any kind of confusion. And he didn't. He became a... He had a very illustrious career, in fact, and was a distinguished stage actor performing at Regent's Park Open Air Theatre in London, uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company in Stratford-upon-Avon, and at the Old Vic. So he's like classically trained (laughs) some of his earlier roles and the roles that he's really known for on stage are a lot of really classical roles he played achilles in the edwardian revival of troilus and cressida macduff in macbeth ludovico and othellos and aeschylus in romeo and juliet uh, as well as a ton of other really prolific roles in a ton of really prolific plays <laughs> and then during the 60s he established himself as a very successful uh, character actor and then just did a bunch of television and movies um he appeared in small roles in the entertainer and perry mason uh but had his breakthrough in 1967 in the film the night of the generals He also appeared in two separate James Bond films, You Only Live Twice and Diamonds Are Forever. And this is, oh, we're going to put a photo on the blog. Yes. He played uh, Blofeld, the character that Dr. Evil from Austin Powers was based off of. He was not like the only person who played Blofeld, but he was one of them. And there's this really incredible picture of him in like the gray suit with Uh the white cat on his lap yes and he's got a gun but he's so but it's like you know like the james bond like it's a tiny gun that (laughs) the spy gun he could have pulled that out from between his butt cheeks you know (laughs) and then he kind of kicked off his more uh busy decade With Rocky Horror, when Mm -hmm. he played the criminologist. And then he also played Lord Seacroft in the television series The Upper Crusts, which is a short-lasting series. But you said it sounds like Schitt's Creek? Yeah, it sounded like like an early British version of, of Schitt's Creek. You know, like, rich family falls on hard times. They have to learn how to live like normal people, blah, da, 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 da. Like Arrested Development, too. Kind of, yeah. I mean, it sounds like one of those shows. I don't know if it was a comedy, but from what I read about it, it that seemed to follow that same plot line. He's also pretty well known as uh, Mycroft Holmes. He appeared in quite a few Sherlock Holmes-related things. Mm-hmm. Um couple different tv series is 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 this is is a couple different like made for tv movies he was like pretty pretty well established in that universe that's so funny yeah he uh you know it's very interesting how many roles he was in and yet the one that he's best known for is crim mm-hmm. <laughs> and at that, like, yes, it's a narrator role, but, like... It's such an impactful role. It does... Is Krim... Where does he rank in your, like, favorite characters? I honestly think he's hilarious. Um, He's... I wouldn't say, like, my favorite character, but I would say he's definitely up there. I've started to rank my favorites based on how much they confuse me. <laughs> <laughs> and right now it's like Dr. Scott and Krim tied for first because I just need, there's like, I need to know if Krim 
What if Krim is sitting in the other room the whole time? Like, Seriously. Really, what if he's sitting in another part of the castle and is like, yeah, I'm Chris Harrison. Here's there. Here are all the contestants in the other room. I'm sitting here in my robe with my mimosa. Literally, his his decanter of <laughs> whatever that dark alcohol is. Unfortunately, Charles Gray did pass away uh, due to cancer on March seventh, two thousand. Um, I mean, it's it's a really big loss for us. He's such a great actor. Um, he didn't have any children and he was never married, but, you know, he did let, leave a very lasting legacy. Mm-hmm. And love him in shock treatment as well. Yes. He I'm is very... the judge in shock treatment. Oh, I have so many questions <laughs> about that too. If they're like... If he's the same person. I have I, I have feelings about that. We'll mm-hmm. talk about it later. <laughs> In this study, Krim is wringing his hands together. He is, like, raising his eyebrows. He's quite scandalized by what he's just seen. And I don't know if that's him reacting because he's, like, a human. And he's uncomfortable. And he's reading this document. That's like, okay, the paper says they got turned to stone. So I'm, I don't know what to tell you. I'm reading, I'm reading you their statements. <laughs> like I, if it sounds ridiculous to you, imagine taking the statement down and having to look Brad and Janet in the face when they say we return to stone and be like, uh, sure. Sure. Then what happened? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> he says, but it was to be in a situation which none of them could have possibly foreseen. And just a few hours after announcing their engagement, Brad and Janet had both tasted forbidden fruit. He is pretty heavy-handedly suggesting that the meeting was intending to occur at Frankenstein Place. You know? Because he says fate almost sarcastically. Like, they think that by totally random circumstances, they're all together here. (laughs) Unless do you think... Okay, okay. Do you think Riff Raff Magenta from... Denton Episcopalian pegged out Brad and Janet and then what if they sent the note to Dr. Scott? Ooh, they've set this whole thing up from the very beginning. Yes. Like like they're the sim overlords that are like, I'm gonna they think they're all getting a random invitation. Mwahaha. They're Mr. Body. Yes, getting them all in the same place at the same time. Exactly. Because they, I think Riff and Magenta uh, could have foreseen all of the events that are occurring tonight. I think that's why they're so successful in their takeover. But oh my gosh. Yeah, Brad and Janet did just get engaged earlier in this evening. Yes. In this evening. Like, could you (laughs) imagine? You went out to... A dinner with your was boyfriend you got engaged you were like wow this is awesome and then like on the drive home all of this happened <laughs> like it's insane it's insane that all of these events occur on one night and the criminologist continues this in itself was proof that their host was a man of little morals and some persuasion. What further indignities were they to be subjected to? Hmm? <laughs> and behind Krim, we see that marital law book. Super visible. Mm-hmm. Again, just behind his left shoulder. What do you think that means? 
I mean, if we're coming at it from the standpoint of Krim is a Transylvanian, which I think we're kind of convinced at this point, I think he's studying human practices. You know what mm. I mean? Like human related relationship practices. Marital law, though, that means like they're trying to figure out a formula to it. Do you know what I mean? Mm. 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 <laughs> well, there's eight white leather band tomes, which are different from all of the other like black leather bound books that are uh, lining the shelves. Maybe those are the successful experiments. Ooh. Yeah, I don't know. I'm so curious. Edwina is in one of the white books. Ooh. Edwina Von Scott. Mother of Eddie. The character that we have created. <laughs> and also in this shot, the globe is very prominent. That's mm-hmm. on Crim's desk. And he's either studying humans or aliens... It comes down to, like, what? why did he take these statements? And also, if I can believe that there are so many Transylvanians running around Denton that, like, they get casually hired for Ralph and Betty's... Wedding. Wedding photos. Um, to take their wedding photos, then I can believe that there's Transylvanians in the police department at Denton, too. Mm-hmm. You know? Crim suggesting that Frank is not conventionally religious and also not strictly heterosexual or homosexual or anything. He can be persuaded uh, whichever way the wind blows, I think. And what of the floor show that had been spoken of? Yeah, what of a floor show? What do you mean... A floor show. Is it just like the the finale, the grand the grand event that like everyone paid their tickets for, and this is all the like previews? I'm also really nervous to say this next part because this is one of my favorite callbacks that comes along with this line. In an empty house, in the middle of the night. What diabolical plan had seized Frank's crazed imagination? What indeed? From what had gone before, it was clear that this was to be no picnic. And the callback I love? What diabolical chicken (laughs) stepped on your forehead, (laughs) stole your neck, and shat on your tie? And I say it I, it's uncontrollable. Uh-huh. I have to say it. Yeah. Yeah, it's like me and the hissing. I get it. <laughs> Can't not say it. But, like, he's not wrong. There, this is maybe 3 a.m., 4 a.m. Yeah. Like, who is, if you're saying that this is a ticketed event, if I'm to believe that Frank is kidnapping people to be able to put on his Floor own shows. sick little show... For his own amusement, that's what it is. Like, it is just for Frank's own sick amusement. Krim's got those crazy eyes. Oh, yeah. Because, okay, now I'm thinking. Okay, so we know we have the RKO broadcasting antenna Mm -hmm. during the floor show. If Dr. Scott's talking about being projected through time and space, can I believe that they're getting a live video stream of the floor show and they're about to see the the grand event after seeing the casting process? Yeah. To see who's going to be the final four in the floor show? Yeah, I mean, I I totally think that's a possibility. Especially if we're going on that this is a reality show. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise, like, what is what is so diabolical about putting a bunch of fishnets on people and forcing them to dance around? Or is it? <laughs> we do that. We get dressed up in fishnets and dance around. We're also not forced to do it. 
I didn't mean to pause because that sound that made that <laughs> that sounded suspicious. <laughs> but are like Brad and Janet prepared for their sexual awakening? Really, that yeah. they're experiencing tonight. I mean, they definitely are kind of being forced into uh, some deep heavy uh trauma awakening yes and i don't think it's exactly fair of frank to be making that decision for them yeah um but as crim size like it is what it is (laughs) no picnics allowed none zero picnics we end our segment yep yeah, and that's this, all we got for you this time. But no, it's not. We have some. We have an excellent voice memo. <gasps> we do from a very suave British man named Andy, who sounds like Matt Lucas. Totally so does. His theory is brain melting and exploding simultaneously. The er, Tim and Eric exploding fireworks <laughs> gift that's my me when he was saying okay just you, you just hear it now uh hello my name is andy and uh i'd like to say thank you to Haley and katie for having me on here i've always thought that there's a similarity between the rocky horror picture show and the classic stories of frankenstein by mary shelley and dracula by bram stoker i see particularly a similarity between brad and Jonathan Harker. Uh, They both end up in a spooky castle. They are both psychologically tormented by a strange being, where with with Harker it's Dracula, but with Brad it's Frankenfurter. Uh, Janet is Brad's innocent sweet fiancé, as is Mina Murray to Jonathan, and in both stories, uh, the both innocent young women are seduced by the vampiric characters of Dracula and Frank. Frankenfurter himself would be Dracula for obvious reasons. He's mysterious, he's from a distant land, and he dabbles with the supernatural or science. For fans of Frankenstein, you can see the parallels between uh, Eagle and Riff Raff. Both are hunchback servants who obey a master they despise. The, the monster in Shelley's story is Rocky in this movie, a man who is brought to life by a science and electricity, uh, much in the same way that Adam was in the Frankenstein story. Dr. Frankenstein wishes to create life because he wants to become God. But Frankenfurter wishes to create a man with whom he can just have sex. So it's kind of like an insult or an affront to God. As though Frankenfurter hates God. Dracula also affronted God when he became a vampire over the death of his wife Elisabetta. If you've seen the movie with Gary Oldman. Maybe not in the book. Also, the, the three vampiric women in Dracula in this movie have become Columbia and Magenta. Who also both love and hate Frankenfurter. Dr. Scott as being the Van Helsing to Frank's Dracula. And that would also probably make Eddie the delivery guy the, the replacement for Dracula's servant Renfield. Although Renfield has more in common with Rev Raff. But I see the Rocky Horror Picture Show as an amalgamation of Frankenstein and Dracula. Dr. Scott, I believe, wanted to include Brad in his plan. That's why Brad and Janet are on their way to meet him. He wanted to include them in his plan to thwart Frankenfurter. But with this fantastic movie, it's the musical numbers, it's the costumes, the characters, the writing, and the acting that make the movie totally its own thing. So you can see Dracula and Frankenstein in it, and many other movies or books. I think it's clear that not only is the Rocky Horror Picture Show writer Richard O'Brien drawing on the old B-movies for aesthetics, but also he is drawing on the two classic pieces of literature for story. But you can enjoy it for what it is. Uh, So check out Time Warp Radio. It's a very good podcast about an amazing movie. Uh, Thanks for listening. So we cannot wait to think (laughs) about that and uh, talk to you guys again soon. But until then, you can find us on Instagram at Time Warp Radio. You can find us on Facebook, Time Warp Radio Podcast. Our blog is timewarpradio.blogspot.com. Feel free to send us an email at timewarpradiopod at gmail.com. We have a Twitter at timewarpradpod. <laughs> and don't forget, on, on Wednesdays, Wednesdays we, we watch, watch Rocky. Rocky. Bye. Bye. Please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. It really helps us out, and we appreciate all your feedback. We'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.